We come now to the 26th study presentation here at the, the British Columbian Camp 1984. This is the 730 study on Wednesday night, the 29th of August this year. Now, we've been looking together at the history of this movement, at the great prophecies which tell where we are in the unrolling of the scroll and give to us the assurance that we're nearing the end of time. I thought the night would be very appropriate for, the, for us to go back and review the grand old landmark of a good basic gospel presentation. I think this is quite necessary to complete the presentation in regard to the movement because if for no other reason there's quite a number of, well there's a few people here I think, especially the younger people who would be benefited greatly by a simple practical presentation on how to gain living victory over the sin problem in our lives. It'll be like playing a, a very old piece of music again. <laughs> I find it never becomes too old to be uh, enjoyed as a blessing to us all. <clears throat> I, might, I might tonight use a few new terms which I think will assist in making the message clearer, but will not in any sense the word change the meaning of the grand old truth we learned from the very beginning. What I am gratified about is this, that um, once we began the presentation of the message given by God to Wagner and Jones, we've never ever lost the beginning of our faith. The original presentations are still valid. We can preach Romans 7 and 8, for instance, today just as we did 20 years ago, which of course is not true of other movements around about us. But turn first of all to John, that is the first epistle of John, right over by the book of Revelation to note some statements in regard to the mission of Jesus Christ in the third chapter 1st John chapter 3 and um, we begin with verse 1 and read down to about verse 9 or 10 Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should, that we should be called the sons of God therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear where we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you by any means, deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And this last is the main scripture I wish to bring to your attention this evening. In the second part of this verse which says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now primarily what is Satan's work? To incite the sin. And the secondary work, of course, is to affect the death of those in whom he plants the sin principle. Now, in the Word of God, we're plainly told that deliverance from the indwelling presence of sin is achieved by faith, and by faith alone. Now, I know that we're quite well aware, of course, of what sin is. I shan't take a great deal of time enough this evening, although it's quite important in this presentation. Sin is what we are, it consists of an indwelling presence, a power, a life, or a spirit. Now lately I've been describing, I'll use this term to tomorrow when we talk about uh, the subject of child salvation, which I've been requested to do, and I think it's very important we do so, even though we looked at it last year. And in that presentation we describe the indwelling presence of sin as being the spirit of disobedience. Now, of course, this word spirit, I suppose, has different meanings in the minds of different people. Some people think of a spirit as being a kind of a wraith, a little bit of misty cloud that floats around without shape. Um, well, it, it changes shape 
as it's very flexible and light, you can put your hand straight through it and so forth, as some folks think is a spirit is, a ghost as you might say. But the word spirit really means a life. It means a presence, it means a power. And the spirit of disobedience is a term which means that within the person there is a power which makes him want to disobey. It is, uh, as one little boy called it, my won't power. <laughs> my resistance to commands, my determination not to do as I ought to do. Now I think if I was to ask some of the children here tonight, and the, the older children especially, uh, if they are aware that they have the Spirit in them, they would certainly say, yes, I, I know about it. I find it's present with me when I want to do the right thing. And um, when I ask another question, do, do you really want to feel that way, to be that kind of person? They say, no, I don't. That's the answer I've got from all the children I've talked to so far. Not on this campground, I haven't asked those questions here, but on other campgrounds around the world. Now the point is, of course, that while we have in us a spirit of disobedience, then we have a disposition to do wrong, a desire to do wrong, a natural inclination to do wrong, and we don't want to do what is right. We call it perversity, disobedience, a rebellion, and stubbornness and so forth. Now, that presence in us is the work of Satan. In fact, uh, the Bible calls him the father of all murderers and liars and sinners. And uh, because he is the father of the spirit which he implants in the person, he of course is the one who is responsible for its origin or presence there. It's his work, it's his purpose to install that in the human family. Now Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And as surely as the spirit of disobedience is the work of the devil, then Christ came to destroy that spirit of disobedience right out of the person altogether and to put into its place a new spirit, the spirit of obedience. Now there's no greater joy that can come to any person, be it man, woman or child, boy or girl, than to have that wretched old spirit of disobedience taken out and the new life of Christ put into its place. Let's turn back to Romans, the first chapter, to a well-known scripture tonight. I want to speak not so much on the actual sin problem as on the way of faith whereby this deliverance can be obtained. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, with a special reference to verse 16. And here Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now then, if you are in a battle and you have a great champion fighting against you and the person on your side is a little weakling, then how do you feel about him? Proud or ashamed? Ashamed. For instance, you've all heard the story of David and Goliath. I'm talking to the young people tonight as much as anybody. And um, this great giant Goliath was the pride of the Philistines. They were proud of him. He was so big, so strong, so fit, so well able to fight. And on the other side, King Saul couldn't find a champion to go out and war against him. Not one single champion. When all his soldiers saw Goliath, they began to shake in their shoes and say, not me, send somebody else. And no, but there was no one else to go. And so poor King Saul was ashamed of his soldiers and uh, of himself too. But when David came along in the faith of God and the power of God, he was not afraid, although the king had the most serious misgivings about whether this young man could possibly go down there and kill this mighty giant of whom the Philistines were so proud. Now, if I had a religion which did not give me victory over sin, which did not change my life, I'd be ashamed of that religion, wouldn't you? I'd regard as worthless, not worth having. But Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, I'm proud of it. Why was he proud of it? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. So we have a gospel which is so powerful, so effective, so sure, that there's no need to be ashamed of it. We know, of course, that the true Christian church down the ages has been a despised and oppressed people, few in number, poor in this world's goods, 
lacking the great intellectual minds which seem to mark the outside world and Christians have generally been ashamed of their religion and well they might be because it's been a weak religion lacking life and power but in these last days when once again the mighty truth of God's saving power is brought back to light again we become aware of the magnitude of God's saving power and we experience that saving power and are no longer the victims of the spirit of disobedience then like Paul we can say I'm not ashamed isn't that good? absolutely that's wonderful and he's not ashamed he says because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth and those two words everyone who believes to put them in more modern English are extremely important in this connection and tonight I want to talk about this element of faith as the essential ingredient in victory over the sin problem and bring it to the place where we can say I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ now let's turn back to the gospel of John and I want to look at one of my favourite stories in regard to uh, the matter of deliverance from sin by living faith and this is the story of the man who had a very very sick son back in the city of Capernaum Capernaum was the was the most important city in the north up by the Sea of Galilee and it was at the opposite end of the land of Palestine from Jerusalem and not too far away from uh, Capernaum was a little town called Cana where Jesus performed his first miracle the making of water into wine at the marriage feast now this nobleman as I said had a very very sick son it was very plain that the boy was not going to live for very long he was, he was going to die unless some very special help was given to him we read the story in John the 4th chapter starting with verse 46 and we'll read a few of the first verses right now so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee he went unto him and besought him that he should come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death then said Jesus unto him except you see signs and wonders you will not believe now if you don't believe then is the, power, is, the, is the gospel the power of God to you it's not because the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth and if we don't believe it's not the power of God it's just a theory an idea something you've heard about something you might even argue about but it's not the power of God now so Jesus said to this man you will not believe unless you see signs and wonders first and it's extremely important that everyone who seeks for salvation understands what Jesus said to that nobleman because Christ put his finger on the commonest shortcoming that uh, pervades any person who is seeking to gain deliverance from the sin problem and it's that particular shortcoming I want to elaborate upon this evening now I turn to the Desire of Ages page 196 and 197 and we'll start to read some of the commentary here on this experience of Christ with the nobleman it says the Galileans returned from the Passover brought back the report of the wonderful works of Jesus the judgment passed upon his acts by the dignitaries at, at, at Jerusalem opened his way in Galilee many of the people lamented the abuse of the temple and the greed and arrogance of the priests they hoped that this man who had put the rulers to flight might be the look for deliverer now tidings had come from those certain that seemed to confirm their body state anticipations it was reported that the prophet had declared himself to be the Messiah but the people in Nazareth did not believe well let's pass, pass over Nazareth to the next paragraph the news of Christ's return to Cana soon spread throughout Galilee bringing hope to the suffering and distress in Capernaum the tidings attracted the attention of a Jewish nobleman who was an officer in the king's service before I go any further let's come back now and notice the point the Galileans who returned from the Passover brought back the report of the wonderful works of Jesus now if you try an experiment 
for instance, and you, you take ten people down to uh, some event, maybe a, a sporting event or a parade in the city or even have them, if they happen to be there when an accident takes place, and you ask those ten people to describe what they saw, will they all give an identical report? No, they won't. In fact, this fact is so well known that if in a court of law two witnesses give identical reports, they know they have been in collusion with each other before the court case took place, and they, and they just discount their evidence. Now, when these Galileans came back from Jerusalem then, they would come back reporting their, most, their strongest impressions about Jesus Christ. Now, if Christ, of course, had been dressed up in fancy clothes with uh, a big red helmet and uh, a blue sash or something, what would they have come back reporting? Just that. If he'd been like the Pharisees and uh, was trying to parade his own importance and was doing things to attract attention to himself, what would they have reported? Just that. But what did they come back reporting? They came back reporting the character of Jesus as it showed out in his face and his wonderful power to heal the sick and the cripples and the blind and so forth. And they did not talk about the appearance of Jesus. That didn't, that didn't catch their attention. They were so busy looking at the work of Jesus Christ and the power of Jesus Christ that they did not think anything about the clothing that he was wearing. Now then, when this report came back to the nobleman, he naturally, naturally formed in his mind a preconceived idea of what Christ would look like. Now then, in the minds of a worldly person, there is, well, I shouldn't say it's impossible, but it's unlikely, it's unusual to separate power from pride. In other words, show us a worldly, unconverted man full of power and what you also find him full of. Pride. The two always go together in the unconverted heart. Always. And this nobleman had never known a converted person, probably, or at least any significant uh, converted person. And consequently, when he heard about the wonderful power of Jesus, what did he expect to see? A proud man. A man in fine clothes followed by a retinue of important servants who, who cared for his every need and so forth. And when this man came to Jesus and found him dressed as a poor, dusty traveller, followed by a few fishermen and uh, disciples of, of various uh, occupations, previous occupations, then he could hardly believe that this man was a man of power. Because... While he associated power with pride, he associated humility with weakness. And he was a humble man before him, therefore he had to be a weak man. And so the man then was in a great difficulty at this point. Now let's come back to the book again, page 197. A son of the officer was suffering from what seemed to be an incurable disease. Right? It seemed to be an incurable disease. Physicians had given him up to die. But when the father heard of Jesus, he determined to seek help from him. Now in the Bible, disease is a symbol of what? Sin. Right? Sin as a master. Sin as an indwelling presence. Sin as a ruling force over the life of the person whom that sin is resident. Now I suppose, children, that you've uh, had in your lifetime some very special occasions. Maybe uh, you plan to go to a school picnic, or maybe mother and father plan to take you for a trip to somewhere, and you are all eager and happy in anticipation of going on this journey to see this wonderful uh, site, or have this nice picnic, or whatever it might happen to have been. And then maybe, and, I, ha and I, I, I hope it didn't happen too often, but maybe the night before you were to leave, you went to bed feeling okay, but at midnight you woke up with a sick stomach and a sore head and a fever, and all kinds of problems, you were as sick as could be, and and um, just the same you said, but tomorrow I'm going to go to that picnic, I will not stay home. But when it came time to get up, your head went round and round and round, you couldn't get up, the sickness said you're going to stay home, and you said, I'm going to go, who won the battle? The sickness did, didn't it? Unless it was very mild, but it was a real sickness, the sickness won the battle. 
And so sickness in you is a master over you. It's something which rules you against your will. And so disease is a most appropriate symbol for the indwelling presence of sin. Just as disease within a person rules him, so sin inside a person also rules him. Now back there, when victory over sickness was virtually un well, it was quite unknown amongst the Jews and certainly unknown amongst the Pharisees and the leaders of that time, this disease within this boy was to them incurable. Now how do men today, including of course ministers and theologians, how do they regard the sin problem? Incurable. It can't be cured. And they express this in words such as, why no one can be perfect. We're all human, you know, and we'll remain, with, we'll remain sinful until Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and then at last, as he comes down the corridors of the sky, he will cure our sicknesses and we'll go home perfect people. In the meantime, sin, sickness is incurable. Now, until Jesus came, and um, to him, of course, it was not incurable. He had the power to take care of that problem. He did take care of that problem eventually. All right, so we find now that we have a nice illustration of um, this of our present problem in the presence in the fact that we have in us the spirit of disobedience until we're truly born again Christians. I read on now and uh, note the following words that first of all I note them, that the man doubted whether Jesus Christ could be the person who's come, who could heal his son because he appeared to be so humble and uh, unpretending but just the same he still decided to give it a try I'll give it a try he said and so he said to Jesus Christ would you please come to my home? My son is dying of sickness and just maybe you can help him. The scripture says, uh, I don't need to tell us what he said actually, just simply says that he besought him to come down, doesn't it? Right, verse 47, and besought him, besought him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. Now, at this point, this man has certain reservations in his mind. He had not seen the power in Jesus Christ. He didn't really believe in the power of Jesus Christ. And so he was virtually saying, well, I've heard about his reputation. I've, I've heard what he's done for other people and maybe, just maybe he can do the same thing for me. So I'm going to ask him and then I will see what will happen. I'll, I'll be watching to see what will happen. And if I find, he said, that uh, my son gets healing, then I'll believe. But if otherwise, I won't believe. And of course, he didn't spell it all out in just so many words, but subconsciously, of course, that was the approach. And um, no doubt you've come across people, in, in fact, I heard uh, one being spoken about today described to me in the following terms, that this person, it was not today, it was yesterday, actually, that this person had uh, read Bondage to Freedom and is uh, had a somewhat sceptical turn of mind and, and more or less said, well, I'll, uh, I'll go through the procedures and he went through the procedures and uh, then nothing happened and so he said well he said it doesn't work it can't be true there are, there are some rather unfortunate uh, um, deficiencies in that man's logic or illogic is whichever way you like to look at it now let's come back to the story before us tonight here in the Tsar of Ages and we're thinking now of an event almost 2,000 years ago and as we read this story there's one thing you are sure about. One thing you're not questioning as I read the story. One thing you have no doubts about and it is that Jesus Christ had the power to heal that, man of his, that man's boy of his sickness. Right? Does anybody doubt that? No. We can always believe what happened 2,000 years ago, can't we? Believing it can happen now is another story. Now, when, when that young man I'm talking about uh, a few moments ago decided the message didn't work, so therefore the message could not be true, he made a profound mistake. And in the way, or in the pathway of getting victory over our sin problem, one thing we get absolutely settled in our minds is this, that there's nothing wrong with the message. It's working for other people, is based upon the great promises of God and there's nothing wrong with those promises, is there? So we settle that in our minds. 
and we, and we don't go beyond that point until that point is incontrovertibly settled and finished with forever. We never let ourselves doubt that point hereafter, and if we find difficulty really believing it, we go back to the promises and read those promises until those promises are absolutely fixed in our minds. I remember so distinctly back when the message first came that there were all kinds of doubts being thrown around and uh, as I said in my story the other day I went into retirement for three months retirement for many kinds of actors uh, discussed on the message and I studied and studied and studied in order to prove myself wrong but every single time I opened the pages of Desire of Ages or the Bible I found it always read the same Sin shall not have dominion over you I read again, I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I read again, but thanks be to God that giveth us the victory. I read again that there is no temptation taken you but such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. I read in the Star of Ages where it says that a holy temper, a Christ-like life, is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. Desire of Ages, page 311. I could not change those words. And the more I read those words, the more I believed in those words. Now, in other words, if I read the message and I read these great promises and I go through the procedures and nothing happens, I find myself still a slave to sin, I don't say, well, so much for that message, let me try another one. We don't say that. We say, there's something wrong with my approach. I, I need to go back and re-examine my procedures, my faith and so forth and, and perseveringly plead until I do get the victory. Remember the difference between a wise and foolish virgin in early writings, page 271? The wise and the foolish both pleaded for victory over sin. But the foolish did not perseveringly plead and agonize for it until they got it. They only plead and agonized so far, and when they didn't get results quickly and immediately, what did they do? They gave up and they lost their eternal life by so doing. So, in our quest for eternal life, remember the man of Romans 7 who keeps at it, he doesn't give up, he keeps on trying and failing, trying and failing until at last he wins through and gets that precious victory. And when he's got it, of course, he becomes a new man altogether in Christ Jesus. So, this is why Jesus Christ said that those who endure to the end are the ones who shall be saved. We recognize this, of course, as maintaining faithfulness to the message over a long period of time. They could also have an application to enduring to the end of the Romans 7 experience until we do actually get the victory over sin. Now, when Jesus Christ said to that man, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, he very accurately analyzed that man's problem. Now, in those words was the power of God. What, when Jesus spoke, he spoke, the, he spoke the Word of God because he was the Word of God. And when Christ spoke, there was more than just uh, language syllables being expressed. When Jesus spoke, living power flowed out of him in those words. And ministered to by the Holy Spirit, that man that day was led to see where the deficiency in his faith lay, as I shall now read, on page 198 of the same book, Desire of Ages, like a flash of light, the Saviour's words to the nobleman laid bare his heart. He saw that his motives in seeking Jesus were selfish. His vacillating faith appeared to him in his true character. In deep distress, he realized that his doubt might cost the life of his son. He knew that he was in the presence of one who could read the thoughts and to whom all things were possible. In an agony of supplication, he cried, Sir, come down here, my child, die. His faith took hold upon Christ and to Jacob. When resting with the angel, he cried, I will not let you go except you bless me. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 26. Let's come back now and analyze this paragraph more carefully because it's an extremely important one. It says, Like a flash of light, the Saviour's words to the nobleman laid bare his heart. He saw... His, uh, that his motives in seeking Jesus was selfish. His vacillating faith appeared in his true character. In deep distress, he realized that his doubt might cost the life of his son. 
In other words, the words of Jesus Christ carried in the in the awesome power of the Holy Spirit swept away that man's laid of sin blindness, took the scales from his eyes and gave to him a picture of himself as he really was. This man had a mighty motivation, of course, to accept the testimony of Jesus because he desired to see his son saved and he realized his doubt might cost the life of his son. Now, the next sentence says he knew. He knew he was in the presence of one who could read the thoughts and to whom all things were possible. In other words, that man, through his contact with the word of God, was given a living revelation of the power of God. A living revelation of it. And anybody who aims to get personal victory over sin must get that kind of revelation. It is gained by studying the great promises of God until our beings become saturated with them and they literally become a part of ourselves. Now, for instance, when David, to go back to his story with Goliath, uh, came to the camp of Israel and found all these chicken-hearted men who would not get in and fight the giants, remember that their plight was due to the fact that they had no vision of God's power, that they measured Goliath's strength against their own strength, and they correctly saw that they were no match for this monster who was challenging the soldiers of Israel. But when David came along, he did not measure Goliath by David. He measured Goliath by God because David knew God and he knew the power of God and could therefore measure Goliath against the might of God. And of course, in David's view, with that kind of measuring line, Goliath was a very, very small and weak being indeed. And in, the, in, in that kind of faith and power, he went down and brought that giant to his knees and to his death. So this man, then this gentleman, came to the place where he, where, where he gained a living revelation of the power of God itself as he realized he was in the presence of one who could read the thoughts and to whom all things were possible. Now, the moment that he recognized that awesome power, he instantly realized that Jesus Christ did have the power to heal his son or would heal his son. And so reaching out, he laid hold by faith upon the promise. He grasped it and became his very own. As, 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 as it became his own, he said in effect, I will not let you go except you bless me. Saying, of course, aloud, Sir, come down ere my child die. Now right here is a statement which we, if you, if you remember nothing else tonight, remember this one sentence. And it says, like Jacob he prevailed. Now comes the sentence. The Saviour cannot withdraw from the soul that clings to him, pleading his great need. Now Christ cannot withdraw from such a soul. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. So if you are aware of your spiritual destitution, if you know that you need to become a born-again Christian, if you find yourself possessed of the spirit of disobedience day by day, be you a child or adult as the case may be, and if, you, if, if God has created in your heart a longing to be free from these things, then after having absorbed the great deliverance promises from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, then when the due time comes, go before God and don't simply ask Him in tame terms, in, in weak words, please will you kindly take away my sinful nature, but come with 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 strong faith and determination to say, Lord, you have promised, and God has promised. And quote some of those promises to God, just to strengthen your own faith further. You promise, uh, you, you, you tell the Lord that you will take away my sin, you will destroy the works of the devil, you will affect my, my sanctification, you will take away the stony heart out of my flesh and give me a heart of flesh. Lord, you promised to do these things. And now I come, I confess to you that I am possessed of the spirit of disobedience I have in me the stony heart I have in me the old man of sin the child of Satan and I give these, this force this spirit to you I give it to you and I receive into this place your own divine life now that's what that man did because he received spiritual restoration at the same time as his son received spiritual, uh, physical restoration now that man did not look for any visible evidence of the promise. He didn't even bother about that because he knew his son was restored even though the boy was quite a number of miles away. Let me stress this point. That man did not 
start saying to himself, I, what, where's the evidence now? What am I going to see the healing of my son? If that had been his concern, he would have rushed him as fast as he could and, and jumped in the door and taken his child's pulse, felt to see the temperature was, was gone, was that, and, and to see if the heart was still beating. Now, Cana is not very far, far from Capernaum. And it wasn't so late in the day, but that father could easily have walked home that afternoon or even ran home that afternoon or hired a horse or a chariot or whatever. But he didn't bother at all. He rather preferred to go home very leisurely and slowly, very in a very relaxed manner, and didn't get home till quite well into the next day. So when he arrived home, he didn't need to be told his son was healed. He knew it. All he wanted to know was at what time the boy was healed and when told the hour of the day when the fever left him he recognized at the same instant Christ had said to him go your way your son lives now I recall with great distinctness the time when the experience first came to me back in 1954 or as early 55 that uh, my faith grasped the promises I believed that God had done what he promised and it seemed entirely inconsequential to start looking for differences in myself. I didn't even, didn't even think of doing that. That thought never occurred to my mind at all. And um, over the next few days, I just seemed happy with the peace in my heart, happy with the new knowledge which I had, happy to realize that the great 1888 message was again being brought before our minds. And it wasn't until three weeks later that the car incident told me that there was a very different kind of person in me from what there previously had been and then for the first time I realized there had been a change. And we make the gravest mistake when we go through the procedures and then start looking for differences in ourselves. That, and when we don't find them, then we start to get troubled and perplexed and confused. What we're doing is exactly what that nobleman did and to us Jesus Christ is saying, except you see signs of wonders you will not believe. We're looking for the sign on the wonder, for some evidence, some reassurance that it has worked to, to make us believe that God has actually worked this miracle in our hearts. And when we see the miracle, then of course we feel relieved and say, well, after all, God did do it after all. Which is not really the way of faith at all. So, uh, if, if of course we do take this attitude, and I remember down in New Zealand quite, quite uh, many, many years ago, I was studying with a certain New Zealand farmer and I laid out before him the principles of bondage to freedom and he said well that sounds like the truth to me I'll give it a try I said please don't give it a try just do it well I went my way and uh, came back about I don't know six weeks later probably for another study hoping in the meantime he'd made the experience and he said well he said it didn't work I um didn't do much about it after you left for a while but when I heard you were coming uh, when you, I heard you were coming again I said to myself he told me well Fred's coming I better get busy and do something about this experience so I better try it out <laughs> and it didn't work of course it didn't work and that man is still an unbeliever out there in the cold dark sinful world it'll never work if you try it out Christians don't try out the gospel Christians live the gospel they apply the gospel it's the absolutely infallible remedy for the sin problem for young and old alike and Christians step right in put it into put it into effect and then go their way absolutely believing let me turn to uh, the little book Steps to Christ which I think I've got here yes here it is <clears throat> and I greatly appreciate this marvelous chapter entitled uh, Faith and Acceptance and I turn now to page 51 where we are, where after discussing the man of the pool of Bethesda, we find uh, Sister White saying these words, In like manner you are a sinner. You cannot atone for your past sins. You cannot change your heart and make yourself holy. But God promises to do all this for you through Christ. Now God has promised to atone for your past sins He's promised to change your heart and make you holy. God has promised to make you holy. That's a pretty big promise, isn't it? He's promised to change your heart. Now, to change your heart means to change your very disposition. Instead of the spirit of disobedience, God promises to put into you the spirit of obedience. And He's promised to do it. 
Now, we learned in the Sabbath rest message, and especially in the Philadelphian presentation of the Sabbath rest message, that a Christian never asks any questions beyond what is God's command and what are his promises. And knowing these, we obey the one and trust the other. In respect to tonight's uh, study, of course, God's command is to put away sin. That's his command. What's his promise? He promises, I will change your heart and make you holy. That's his promise. Now, if God's promise, what do we do about it? We believe it. Right? It doesn't matter how fantastic it may seem, how impossible it may appear, how grand and distant and glorious and all the rest of it. If God says he will do it, we believe it. Because the doing, of it is his, the doing of it is his business. And I really love the statement in, in Christ Topic Lessons, page 333, where Sister White says, All his biddings are enablings. All his biddings are enablings. Now, going on down this paragraph, we find that you believe that promise, back to steps to Christ 51, you confess your sins and give yourself to God, you will to serve him. Just as surely as you do this, God will fulfill his word to you. If you believe the promise, believe that you will be forgiven and cleansed. Is that correct? No, it's not. It says, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed, not will be. Alright? You remember it now though. You won't forget it now. If you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed, God supplies the fact you, you are made whole, just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk on the man believed that he was healed. It is so if you believe it. Right? Now, what is the basis of your belief? There's only one basis for belief, and that's the Word of God. Nothing else. We believe because God said it, and for no other reason. You don't believe because you see it. Because your, your eyesight can be very, very deceptive. You believe it because God said it. And this is why it says, Do not wait to feel that you made whole, but say, I believe it. It is so, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. And when things become so bad that um, well, it, is, it is entirely possible that um, when you've gone through the procedures and... Um, claim the promise of God, Satan seems to have the power at times to make it appear that absolutely nothing has been done, no victory has been gained. He seems capable of stimulating the presence of the old sinful nature even after you've gotten rid of it. So when his stimulation surfaces and, and he argues, there you are, you're not changed at all, you simply say, Lord, you take care of that. I gave you that, that's now your business, not mine. And absolutely refused to uh, be persuaded by this... this uh, Spectre that that, that that the devil raised against you. And I learned that lesson many years ago, and I had uh, some problems. I learned that Satan does have the power, but if we defy him and and to go our way rejoicing, then the temptation dies away completely. And so let's be like Paul, as we gain a living concept of Christ, saving gospel, and experience that gospel. Let's say with him, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, the bell is going out to stop.